My name is Klaas van der Tempel. I work as Human General of TU Delft, program maker, and I've organized today's event together with my colleagues. This is part two of a two-part lecture series by our speaker today, but it's also part of a broader series that we're calling Global Philosophies. This is the first to last lecture that we're doing. In about a month, we have the last one of the season. We're going to talk about South American philosophy, indigenous philosophy of Buen Vivir, and the concept of giving rights to nature. Today, uh, in follow-up to the first lecture, which was about uh, Japanese culture and philosophy and was really a warm-up, we're going <clears> to <throat> sort of dive into the deep end and talk about nothingness in Japanese philosophy. Our speaker today is Frédéric Petit. She is a philosopher, independent researcher, but she's also going to tell you a little bit more about herself before she begins. We have about 30, 40 minutes for the presentation. After that, time for Q&A. Um, yeah, so I say let's get started and give a warm welcome to Frederick. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, nice to see so many people returning because that means I did a good job, I hope, the first time. And now, as Glass said, we'll talk about nothingness, the power of nothingness. It's a bit of an aspirational title, maybe, but you know, we have to lure you in. So obviously, it's up to you if there's a power in nothingness. Um, and it ties into, I think, um, Japanese philosophy and specifically the Kyoto School, which we will be discussing. What are we going to do? Um, this is what I had in mind for you. Um, kind of actually chronological view of how I think the Kyoto School came to think and philosophize about nothingness. So we'll start with Zen Buddhism. First I'll, I'll ask you some other questions, but they are more practical about nothing. And then Tetsugaku, that's the Japanese word for philosophy. And I don't know how many times you've pondered the meaning of philosophy in English <coughs> or Dutch. Because we have in Dutch we have philosophy or wijsbegeerte. I think I mentioned that the first time, you know, the love for wisdom, philia for Sophia. But Tetsugaku is actually the learning of wisdom. So that's the important understanding and difference, I think. Uh, the science of wisdom is what Tetsugaku means. So that's why I named it theoretical theory. It's really, you know, the um, the, the approach that you um, that you take. And I think in the Kyoto School, there is actually an argument about how to do philosophy and what philosophy is and how you can philosophize about nothing. So we'll delve into that. And then obviously I have some conclusions. Um, this is very short. This is going to be the shortest slides and time I present on this. This is just my CV, what I've done in the past and what I find interesting, which is a lot, including Japanese philosophy, nothing and something and everything. So this is it. But now for you, again. Um, this is actually a koan that I'll be returning to when we're talking about Zen Buddhism. But, serious question, if you do nothing, what do you do? Just be. And what's just being? Hmm? Breathing. But you see how being and just breathing is then tied to nothing? Because <clears throat> normally when we're when we are, we say we are something, or we have a name that, in my case, is Frédéric Petit, and I've engaged in counterterrorism. I'm now engaging in philosophy. Is that my being? But it's a good question. It's a good answer. I, I'm not trying to, you know, <laughs> get other people to not answer. But being and nothingness are then tied together. So that's actually where I'm going to be going. And how do you understand the difference then between being and nothingness or nothing? Or is it really the same? If this sounds a little bit esoteric right now or a little bit um, vague, don't worry, we'll get to it. Second question. And I thought maybe because most of you are scientists, you would like maybe a formula. But for me, this is the question, is nothing more than anything or is anything more than nothing? Or are you saying that's just a weird question, Frederic? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the perspective is, is of crucial importance. Because if you're talking about natural science or you know astronomy and the universe, there might indeed be more nothing than something. But if you're talking about this whole, I hope that you know there is more anything than nothing, unless nothing is tied to being. 
because then it's again kind of difficult to distinguish. Last question, and then we're going to go to the good stuff. What do you know about nothing or nothingness? Or, and or, have you ever experienced nothing or nothingness? Noth nothing could be when somebody dies that you care about. That could be nothing. Yeah. A void. Something else? Emptiness. Indeed, that's a word that's of crucial importance. Sunyata, what we're going to be mentioning as well. So when you're meditating, the, the notion of time disappears, the notion of the world as it usually appears to you dissipates, goes away, and maybe that's again then tied to being. Because you're still breathing, you're still meditating, you're still doing something, but the whole world, the, the experience of the world and reality can change fundamentally in that moment. So these are a few of the questions, I'll, I'll return to this. <clears throat> but this is just like what you said in regular conversation, what's up? Nothing. How, what are you doing? Nothing. What have you got to do with it? Nothing. Have you what have you done about it? Nothing. And if you're, you know, writing a paper, what have you written? Nothing. <laughs> And then we return to what you said, what is the ultimate meaning of death? And some people call that absolute nothingness. But then again, that's the, I think, Western way of looking at it. You know? But these are a few of these questions that come up in regular conversation where we use the word nothing, but do we really know what we mean when we say nothing? That's one of the fundamental questions that lies behind, I think, uh, what I'm trying to point at. Um, the first question was, if you do nothing, what do you do? This is actually not an intellectual question, so it's kind of fooling you. It is a koan. And I don't know, does anybody know what a koan is here? Show of hands. Yeah, sure. I brought, the, I brought this book. This is obviously the Western interpretation of koans. <coughs> It's called the sound of the one hand. Um, I'll, I'll return to that. But koans are actually a tradition within Zen Buddhism. And Zen Buddhism is something that we really link to Japan, which we can do, of course, because by some stretch of the imagination, there is an origination story from Japan, even though the Japanese Zen Buddhists came to this knowledge from China, and it was called Chan Buddhism. And actually, nowadays, if you go to China, you'll see that Zen Buddhism is more prevalent in China than I think the Chinese government would like to uh, admit, but also maybe <coughs> statistically speaking and relatively speaking more present than in Japan nowadays. So it is something that's changing and Zen Buddhism I think is very very nice as a Western philosopher to g engage with because it's an intuitive sort of philosophy if you want to call it philosophy, but I, I deliberated on that in the first lecture so I won't go into that. But it's about the not knowing, about the non-rational side of life. Because in, in the West, and I was just talking with class about it, we're really trained to understand everything, to use our heads, to wrap it around, to solve the problem, to go to do something, to be effective. But this is making room for the non-rational sides. And a lot of texts in Zen Buddhism, Buddhism uh, point to or explicate what the Buddha nature is, and the Buddha nature is something that is within all of us, and that is what it is, which cannot be named, by impermanency, by changing, or if you want to you know, tie it back to nothingness, it is everything and nothing all into one. And it's the original foundation that everybody has within it. And one of the questions that the first Zen Buddhists asked, and they were members of the Tendai sect in, in Buddhism, was if Buddha nature is with everyone, why do I need to practice? Why do I need to meditate? Why do I need philosophy if it is already there? And one of the answers that Dogen, for instance, came up with was because we are so trained to use our minds that we actually go away from our natural impulses, which is feeling, which is just basically in an organic way understanding what life is about, that Zen Buddhism can help you find your way back to that natural state. At least that's the way I read Dogen. 
And if you enter into a Zen Buddhist community, in the Netherlands at least, you're expected to take four bodhisattva vows. So you promise that you will go the end of the way and you will... <coughs> Stay around to liberate all people, for instance, Satori. Satori is actually the Japanese word for nirvana, for the enlightenment, for the um, ultimate state of being, which, by the way, you should not strive for, because if you're striving for it, you're using your ego, so it should be something that befalls you or falls upon you. And ways to gain Satori, which again you should not be striving for, but means to an end are the koans and meditation. Um, and there are various forms of meditation which I won't go into today, but that depends on the school that you're a member of or the master that you're learning from. About koans, um, oh yeah, this is something that's I think one of my favorite statements from Zen Buddhism. They that know will not speak, and they that speak do not know. So everything I've just said about Zen is on Zen, is not Zen. Actually, <laughs> I have a friend who's, who's entered into a Zen community and he always tells me when I talk about Zen or I have to give a lecture about Zen that actually I should just say, okay, right now let's all put away the chairs and let's sit on the ground and let's just be. But I don't think you would enjoy that so much, so I'm just still going to talk about it a little bit and explicate it. But please mind that, in actual fact, this is not very Zen that to speak about it and to, to intellectualize it. But this is something that you can be doing. This is from the former uh, lecture, you know, the tea ceremony is intimately linked with Zen Buddhist practices because it's all about the doing, the ceremony of the tea and the tea master never does anything accidentally like I'm moving around right now I'm doing that a bit organically and just the way I feel but a Zen tea, a tea, a tea ceremony master is ultimately a very controlled individual that observes the rules and regulations of the practice of the tea and in that practice is the wisdom of Zen in doing is the wisdom or if you just rather be the Zen garden just sitting there and observing and breathing, meditating, reflecting, but not intellectualizing, just watching and maybe going towards the emptiness, not, you know, thinking about your groceries or your papers or anything else, but just trying to stop the thinking. I think that's one of my challenges, it's always been one of my challenges to just stop the thought process. And if you, if you manage to just for a brief moment stop that, I think, I've experienced, it can change a lot in how you perceive the rest of the world. Um, but these are koans, to, to just explicate it in Western way. Uh, they are sometimes used, as I said, as a means to reach Satori. And they can be riddles, questions, statements, to which, in, es in essence, there is no intellectual answer. One of the most fo famous koans, that's the title of this book, is The Sound of the One Hand. What sound does one hand clapping make? And I must admit, you know, at first when I started, you know, interest, my interest in Zen, I became very irritated by these riddles because there is no good answer, you know. The, the, the friend I mentioned earlier, he told me, well, you know, Frederic, it could just be boom. It could just be yellow. It could just be this. And I was like, well, I want to know the right answer. He's like, no, that's the whole point. There is no right answer. You need to accept that certain life questions may not have a cognitive or intellectual or rational explanation or, or answer or, or solution. And that, I think, is what, you know, uh, koans can do. They create space, as I, as I interpret it, for the non-intellectual side of things. But if you become frustrated, don't worry, I've experienced it too. And that's why, you know, this book, I think, is quite nice because it gives you the answers in a way so you can reflect upon it and I think some of the answers if you read them can also guide you into the meditative process so these are this is the most famous one what is the sound of one hand clapping I just explained this a bit so again I'm using Western methods which I shouldn't be doing but then this one show me your original face before the forefathers of your forefathers were born you can't solve it, because who were the forefathers of the forefathers before they were born? And what is the original face? 
So you, you just have to be again, if, uh, if you are learning from a Zen master, um, you have to be. All things return to the one. Where to does the one return? So if we believe, for instance, um, and I'm going into novel fields here, but like the Big Bang theory, that that's the start of the universe. What does that mean? What does that tell us? And also again to this one, the one with a capital O, there's no answer. There's no real solution to it. But you can meditate on it. You can use it as a mantra. And maybe that will kind of relativize other things in your life that you... Uh, that you, that you encounter. What do you think about these koans? Do you think anything, or are you already engaging in them? That could be. They seem a little bit pointless. And why? No, it's, a good, it's a good remark. Why are they pointless, in your opinion? Okay, that's that's a good that's a good explanation again. Then, so there's no point in thinking about them if there's no good answer to them. That's exactly the point, because not everything can be solved by thinking, and by posing these questions, you'll see that these questions, at least, will not have a logical answer. So that might mean that other questions in life also don't have a logical or straightforward answer. And that brings us back to being, feeling the non-rational, non-intellectual side of things. Any other opinions about the koans? Ah, yeah, so you become more self-assured in how you view the world. Because, yeah, that could also be an outcome of it. Yes, definitely. Because there are so many other ways and so many other points of view. But you have given that point of view and for you that resonates. Yeah, definitely. Yes? Yeah, it is about words in a way, but maybe then it's, it's a good thing that I'll, I'll just, you know, uh, explain. <clears throat> I'll, I'll read the first um, version of the, the, one hand, the, the sound of the one hand clapping. And, and in this way, it's, it's formulated a bit differently, but um, <clears throat> here the cone is, is put forward like this. In clapping, both hands, a sound is heard. What is the sound of the one hand? The answer? The pupil faces his master, takes a correct posture, and without a word, thrusts one hand forward. So the, the pupil doesn't say anything anymore, but makes a movement with one hand. And then there's an explanation of the discourse. Master, if you've heard the sound of the one hand, prove it. Answer, without a word, the pupil thrusts one hand forward. Master, it's said that if one, heard, one hears the sound of the one hand, one becomes a Buddha, i.e. becomes enlightened. Well then, how will you do it? Without a word, the pupil thrusts one hand forward. And so it goes on and on, just thrusting one hand forward. And again, this was one of the versions where at first I became frustrated because what's the point in always doing this? And after a while, you know, um, it's, um, the master asked the, the pupil, what if the one hand is cut by a sumo sword? And then the answer is, it can't be, or if it can, let me see you do it. So saying, the pupil extends one hand forward. Well, I hope you have a nice master and he doesn't actually use the sword to <laughs> make a sound. Or, without a word, the pupil thrusts one hand forward. Master, why can't it cut the one hand? Answer, because the one hand pervades the universe. Uh, I see it's a few of you. <laughs> but then again, you know, this is the intellectualized version of koans. I think it's more, if you do this with someone who is into a Zen Buddhism like a master, or someone who's engaged in the practice for a long time, then you might experience also the fun of doing this together. And even though you cannot solve them intellectually, you can experience the, the other side of things. The second question was, is nothing more than anything or is anything more than nothing? And to me, this also points to engaged knowing. Actually, what you said, it's, it's all about your perspective. From what side are you looking at things? And in Western philosophy, I think 
the main object is to have a detached form of knowledge and a detached form of knowing. So to be as objective as possible in order to describe and gain universal knowledge and wisdom. So wisdom that applies here should be the same as the wisdom that applies in Japan, should be the same as the wisdom that applies in Brazil uh, and, and everything. But Japanese philosophy explicitly states that there is a relationship between the knower and the known. And maybe in some of your studies this is also called the observer's effect, right? That when something is observed, the the thing that is observed can change. So there is a relationship, they influence each other. And the objective then is to be as truthful as possible to portray, portray sorry, and describe reality as an interactive crossing point. So your starting point is completely different because the premise is already there that the person who is engaging in philosophy is, for instance, also affecting the philosophy that they're engaging with. And in, in, in Japanese um, language, um, the, the person who actually came up with the term Tetsugaku is Nishi Amane. Nishi is his last name, Amane uh, first name. He lived from 1829 to 1897 and studied here in the Netherlands from 1863 and 1865, so at the end of the Meiji period and when uh, Japan was opened up by force by the United States. And this man, Nishi, he actually t thought and, and stated that in Japan there was no philosophy before the introduction of Western philosophy. And that's why he felt he had to come up with a word. And his word was Tetsu Gaku. And Tetsu is wisdom, but Gaku is the doctrine or learning. So even though the premise that Japanese philosophy starts from is different, namely there is an interactive relationship between the knower and the known, there is also a science that can be observed and can be practiced in order to reach conclusions about what the knower wants to know. And that's the doctrine or learning or science. And Tejujin, that those are wise people or lovers of wisdom. So here's the distinction between what the Western word philosophy means, namely the love for wisdom, and here the science. So even though there are you know, uh, ultimate differences in the premise, uh, there's also a difference in mythology, you could say. So Tetsu Gakusha are philosophers in the Western sense of the word. word. Tetsujin are comparable to sages and in the Japanese philosophy and literature and Japanese philosophy they even mention Heraclitus or Socrates as sages, not as philosophers, because they actually already knew things about the world. If you read some of the uh, dialogues of Plato, you'll see that Socrates at the end of his life presupposes uh, a continuum of life. He actually says the soul is immortal, but how does he know that? How has he come to this wisdom? So that's the difference, uh, they, they say in, in Japanese, philosophy, uh, Japanese philosophy, a difference in method and in substance. And this is, I think, maybe the best way to explain it. A geologist, but maybe some of you are studying geology, so you can maybe <laughs> tell me more, uh, it studies clay as an abstract scientific construct, but the potter, when he's engaging or she's engaging with the clay, they have this intimate relationship. If it's correct and the potter practices more and more and more, he or she becomes better and better and better in making the pots. Even the, the geologist, I hope, will become better and better and better in his job, but will not change the nature of the subject that he or she is studying. But the potter will change the clay that he or she is studying. And that's, I think, a uh, difference. So this is, I think, maybe the best way to, to visualize it. This, the, the first external relationship, that's basically how the West is organized. Philosophy, science, all these things. There is an observer and they can, you know, think about relations. But the Japanese model says that whatever you think about A or B, especially if you're thinking about A and B, places you in the middle of A and B and makes it a relationship. Now, if you're thinking, what does this have to do with nothing? Because this is all something, right? I hope. Um, it's actually what we started off with, because in a Japanese model, you cannot study nothing independently of something. So even nothing and something are related. And when you're starting to think about nothing, you will become affected by what you think about nothing and it will change maybe how nothing is experienced. I'm hoping. 
maybe after today. So nothing is not a detached point of no return. Nothing is nothing like a nihilistic negative sound or concept. Nothing can be both everything and nothing at the same time. And this is the paradox, I think, that Japanese philosophy kind of explicates, which is, I think, in the Western world, not very easy to accept. Because if you think about what I just said, nothing and everything being tied together and being the same, is that not, again, semantics that I'm using now, you know? But it's about the experience. And in order to break this and make it more explicit, we're now turning to the Kyoto School. And the Kyoto School is always a bit problematic in order to define it, because it's not a very scientific construct or a school like Plato's school that they all think the same and they all have the same ideas. In actual fact, um, Nishida and Tanabe actually fell out. These are two of the main people that I'll be introducing to you in a moment, because they had such a major difference on how to practice philosophy and what the, the, the ultimate conclusion is. So I think it's very diverse and I think it offers a very original combination of Western and Eastern philosophy. But mind you, especially also in Japan, the Kyoto School has had a very bad reputation because Tanabe was involved in the Second World War and I didn't pay enough and not, or not enough. I didn't pay much attention to it last time and I'm not really trying to engage in it now, but it has been stated that the Kyoto School was a political accomplice to World War II. So it was actually because of in the 50s and 60s that American and other Western philosophers, or European I should say, started engaging and reading Kyoto School uh, publications that it actually became um, popular again. And now it's an established term that is not so much connected to the Second World War, but you can find articles that mention that and, and go into it. And also in the Western sense, it's sometimes called not philosophy, but religion or theology because it's so esoteric, because it talks about nothingness. Like this book by Keiji, Nishitana Keiji, it's called Religion and Nothingness. Well, I think if you put that forward to Christians or whoever is believing in something, it feels counterintuitive to put the two together. But for Nishitani, in the nothingness, you can be more open or more mindful of the spiritual and maybe even divine uh, connotations that this life, this um, existence has to offer. There are also a few questions that I think resurface. I mean, this lecture is called Japanese philosophy, but one of the ultimate questions is what is Japanese philosophy? Is it philosophy done by Japanese people? Is it philosophy practiced in Japan? Um, that's still a question. How do you distinguish it from other forms of philosophy? And what I find a very interesting question is how do we distinguish philosophy from religion? Because if you take note of the fact that maybe some of the most religious experiences are not able to be put into words and not able to be described logically, um, does that make them not philosophical anymore? Or is that just the point of curiosity to reflect upon more? Um, so which relationship to reality are we investigating? Is it just what we see in the here and the now or what we experience and can think about? And what I would like to do is talk about these three um, philosophers. Mind that I have put the last names first, so this is the Japanese way of maybe usually referring to people, starting with the last name and then the first name. Nishida Kitaro, he's called sometimes the founder of the Kyoto School, then his most famous uh, student with whom he had the disagreements, Tanaba Hajime, and in the end, Nishitana Keiji, who actually followed up and tried to, I think, bridge the two back together in his own work and words. But Nishida Kitaro did not seek to become a founder of the Kyoto School. He's often called like that because of his book that was published in 1911, An Inquiry into the Good, was basically one of the first bestsellers, so to say, in the academic philosophical, philosophical world, um, and is looking for an answer to what Nishida considers the most fundamental question, what is the ultimate reality? And <clears throat> He thinks that that is the experience that is separate from the individual. So it ties maybe or goes to the nothingness. And 
if I have to put this into words, it might become very complex, so I have some diagrams. This is uh, the Western way of looking at experiences, uh, it is said, if you follow the work of Nishida. So there's a self or an individual, and they experience all sorts of things. So you can experience hotness, coldness, boredom, interest, whatever. But the, the experience exists because there is an individual. If there would be no individual, there would be no experiences. You could also translate this into the question, if there is a tree in the forest and nobody is around and it falls down, does it make a sound? In, in this diagram, no, it doesn't make a sound because there's nobody to hear the sound. But for Nishida, this is the ultimate reality. There is, he thinks, or he says, an experience that precedes the individual. And not so much in cosmic terms, you know, that there was a universe before you or there were parents that you had and they had parents. No, something completely distinct from that. And because there is that experience, there can be an individual within who experiences different things. But the ultimate reality, which we call experience one in this diagram, is something that is completely different from what we are experiencing as individuals. And I hope, I hope, but please, you know, raise your hand if you are thinking I've lost you, actually also, raise your hands, because if this one wouldn't be there, this one couldn't be there, and then this one couldn't be experienced. But because this one is contained within the self, and the experience contains the individual, this is a different kind of experience. Is that clear, or are you... I see a few people nodding. Is there someone who is shaking? Did experience one ever happen if there's nobody to see it? Well, yes, actually, in this sense. The, what Nishida is, is trying to say here is that there is an experience that precedes all of our lives, that we cannot change, that is there, and because it is there, we are allowed to be here. But in that experience, the world is completely different from what we experience as experiences too. And the goal for Nishida is to gain knowledge from ex of experience one. But in order to do that, it doesn't suffice to combine experience two, A, B, C, D, three, because you will never bridge the gap to experience one. So. Can experience one contain several individuals? Yes. Basically, this is a simplified diagram. In experience one, all the individuals of the world are, are put in there. And all the organisms and the stars and the planets and everything. Everything is contained within experience one. But experience one is something that is not knowledgeable or rational like experience two can be. Yeah. Yes, so there can be different experiences. Maybe it's good to note that Nishida um, lost one of his children um, when the, his daughter was very young. And that made him change his experience because he started to think about what is the point of life? Why do I need to experience this? Before my life was filled with joy and I had a family and now I have to mourn the death of my young daughter. So yes, there can be various and, and multiple experiences by one individual, sometimes even contradictory. Yeah, in a way it could be, um, especially if you use it metaphorically, but in, in the concrete sense it couldn't be, because you mention it's a sunny day, so you still use your perceptual you know, knowledge and, and things to describe this is a sunny day. Yeah, in a way it is. Oh, yeah. Um, so this is something Nishida also said, which I found very enlightening. It goes without saying that there's much to admire, much to learn from in the impressive achievements of Western culture, which thought form as being and the giving of form as goods. However, does there not lie hidden at the base of our Eastern culture, preserved and passed down by our ancestors for several thousand years, something which sees the form of the formless and hears the voice of the voiceless? Our hearts and minds endlessly seek this something 
and it is my wish to prove this, provide this quest with a philosophical foundation. So here you see the paradox that I think a few of my colleagues in the Netherlands will not accept as philosophy, the form of the formless. <laughs> what? You know, uh, the, the voice of the voiceless. Huh? But it's all tied together. The one cannot exist without the other. And our hearts and minds, so note also the experience again that's, that's prevalent here. Endlessly seek this something and it's my wish to provide this quest with a philosophical foundation. But this is also a statement that I, I thought was very nice. If my heart can become pure and simple like that of a child, I think there probably can be no greater happiness than this. And if you think about your childhood, what was it filled with? It was filled with everything and maybe nothing, because you were maybe not so aspirational. You weren't busy, 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 but you were just enjoying life. You were just playing. You were making friends. And, you know, you laughed a lot more, psychological research confirms, than you are doing as, as you progress. So there it is, nothing and everything, I think, it combined into, into one. Um, Tanaba Hajime, he said the following, all science needs to take some entity or other as its object of study. The point of contact is always in being, not in nothing. The discipline that has to do with nothing Nothingness is philosophy. It's the only part in the scientific community where you can think about nothing and still be called a scholar, you know. So that I thought was something, uh, something, something nice. But now to the difference between their thinking about nothingness, and bear in mind we'll, we'll, we'll dissect this. Thus, while Nishida took absolute nothingness as the transcendent ground of all reality toward which the self that has let go of the subject-object dichotomy breaks through to face reality as it is, Tanaba, Tanabe ultimately came to understand it as the ground of a transcendent force that breaks in upon the self from without. For Nishida, the quality of religious experience associated with absolute nothingness is reviewed by the self-conscious subject philosophically and at a remove from historical conditions. For Tanabe, this very view itself belongs to history and therefore demands an absolute disruption of the conscious subject and an absolute crisis in reason. <sighs> Very big, you know, his statement. But what Nishida says here, and compared to Tanabe, is that there's a transcendent ground. So experience one is kind of a foundation, you would say, but it is intangible, it is transcendent, it is immaterial to a way. But Tanabe said it's a force. So it's moving. It is some sort of energy, even though it is absolute nothingness. You see the paradox, so you see how the discomfort can arise, because how can absolute nothingness still be moving, or still be a force? But that's because of the world is completely different. Another big difference between Nishida and Tanabe is the following. Nishida says, the self has let go of subject-object dichotomy. So you don't see the world with sunny days or rainy days. It's just completely different. It, there is no knower and known. Everything melts into, into each other and the self has let go. But Tanabe says, no, it breaks in upon the self from without. So there's something that comes over you that makes you think about the world differently. Like, for instance, losing someone. I've lost my father when I was 11 years old and the world changed completely because you start to think about what, how, what is happening here. So it breaks in from without and this is something but it's a metaphor, right? It's a comparable metaphor. And then the, the other thing is that for Nishida, you can really think about this nothingness. So it's reviewed by the self-conscious subject philosophically. What I've been trying to do with you by these questions and by, you know, posing koans to you. But for Tanabe, this is absolutely not possible. Kind of like talking about Zen. He says, no, you just have to experience it. And when you experience absolute nothingness, it is a crisis in your intellectual understanding of the world. There is something that is completely different from what the world was before. So you let go of the reason and you just be or you just accept. And the last difference eh, is that for, t for Nishida, you can approach this thinking about nothingness. And note, he mentions absolute nothingness, so not nothing or nothingness, but absolute nothingness, is at a remove from historical conditions, which means it will be the same wherever you are. If you 
experience the absolute nothingness or if you start to think about the absolute nothingness it will be the same here as in Japan as in India as in Brazil as in the United States but for Tanabe it always depends on when you start thinking about nothingness and especially if you do this within a Western culture where like I said before nothingness is obviously often viewed negatively, it means that you have a different experience than when you do this when nothingness is viewed positively, for instance, in Tanabe's mind. So these are a few differences in thinking about nothingness. Now the last one, Nishitani, Keiji, he distinguished three certain fields. So he said you have a first field of consciousness, that is your regular existence. So we're going about our day, we see that sunny outside, we go outside, we enjoy the sun. But then there are instances where, you know, life loses meaning or something happens and we are confronted with horrible things and we're thinking how could this be think about political things or you know not too far away uh, in ukraine and, and russia for instance right now life loses meaning but then for nishitani that is not absolute nothingness because for that you have to go to the field of sunyata and sunyata is actually a term from the sanskrit but he says that is the absolute emptiness which contains everything. So for Nishitani, experience one that I mentioned before in the diagram is a void, is an absolute, absolute void of nothingness, which hmm, is again tied to being. So what he says, emptiness can well be, I'm now here, emptiness can well be described as outside of an absolutely other than the standpoint shackle to being, provided we avoid the misconception that emptiness is something distinct from being and subsisting outside it. On the other hand then, emptiness is truly emptiness only when it empties itself even of the standpoint that represents it as something that is emptiness. True emptiness is to be realized as something you united to and self-identical with being. And then we're back to where we started with you. So it's all tied to each other. Because you cannot distinguish it, Nishitani things. And you cannot think about it conceptually as a thing instead of it, uh, and unless you tie it together with the being of, of, of everything. So this is something he said um, because he was sometimes accused of being a Zen Buddhist with, you know, uh, a philosophical kind of take on things, but he said, if I frequently had occasion to deal with the standpoints of Buddhism and particularly Zen Buddhism, the fundamental reason is that the original form of reality and the original countenance of human beings seem to me to appear there most plainly and unmistakably, because they just enter into my experience without intellectualizing it, without rationalizing it, they're just there. So, in conclusion, I we will answer the three starting questions, and, but I do it backwards. So, have you ever experienced nothingness, or what do you know about nothingness? Hopefully more than before, or at least something. Um, if you did not already know, nothing, nothingness. Is nothing more than anything, or anything more than nothing? Nothing is everything, and everything, and or everything, is nothing. So, I started on a false premise, maybe, trying to trick you a little bit. And the last one, what are you doing? If you do nothing, what are you doing? This is the last koan that I really like. A monk asked Master Yoshu, does a dog have Buddha nature? Mu, said Yoshu. And Mu in Japanese means no, non-existence or no thing, nothing. And I have been told that Mu in Japanese can also be translated as woof. So is that nothing or everything? Are there any questions, remarks, or comments? Thank you, that was great. Uh, Am I on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. We have some minutes for uh, a q and Does anybody have a question? This was about nothingness, but it was so complicated. <laughs> I definitely have some questions, but I want to feel the... I want to give you guys a chance. Anybody want to raise their hand and I'll come up to you with the microphone? Okay, Super. arigato. We have a question here. Uh, so it's a question about the diagram you just posted. Um, uh, the question is, is there any observable effect for the experienced one, so to speak? <laughs> um, that's a good question, but I would, I would think that um, Nishida would say no, because that experience one is so different from experience two that it goes outside being observed. It can only be experienced or 
Yeah, 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 that is true. But because, you know, um, Nishida says in the statement that I read, you know, uh, that the, the experience of absolute nothingness is at a remove from historical, historical points of views, you do not put anything personal in it. It will be the same wherever, whenever you will experience, experience one. And Ah, yeah, Kant, a priori knowledge. Um, maybe, to a certain extent, but it is different, because even a priori knowledge in Kant's belief and philosophy follows the rules of, of natural science, of how every human being would view the world or came to come to know the world. And for Nishida, experience one is really distinct from that. But you can disagree with it, because obviously what he said before is that there's always a tie to the one and the other. Um, but then again in his philosophy he proclaims that the ultimate reality is something that we cannot change. So therefore there would not be an observer effect. But you can, you can disagree with that obviously and, and think that he's wrong in stating that. Anybody else have a question? Uh, I was just wondering, um, what do you do to experience nothing? I meditate, and also that's why I made a reference to Woof, and also in my description I mentioned it, uh, I walk my dog. No, but really, uh, because I think a lot of um, Zen principles point to being present, and not really thinking about things in the future or in the past or whatever, but just being attentive to the present. And I, I have to say, when I watch my dog and walk my dog, I'm with her in the present. And if that's nothing or everything, I leave it up to you. But for me, that's at least where I can get away from the philosophical thinking about nothingness and reading about nothingness and, and things like that. So to me, and that's not to say that I think it's a negative, right? Because I think it's a positive to free yourself from a lot of worries and, and, and preoccupations that we all kind of experience. So to me, that is something that I would call nothingness and experience nothingness. And once I had it also when I was in India, and I was in uh, Tamil Nadu and also um, meditating in yoga things. And I, l apart from that, I was standing in the sea. And I just, you know, when you do that and you watch the waves come and go and your feet sink in the sand more and more as the waves come and go. And that's when I experienced an emptiness, a void that was no negativity at all. But like you described before, the, the sense of time floated away, even though I could feel I was going more and more into the ground, there was nothing preoccupying my, my mind. And that was, I think, also an experience of nothingness. But maybe that's too esoteric, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, guys. We have uh, no more time. I'm going to ask one more uh, question. And I will stay. So if you have questions, you can ask me personally as well. Exactly. I see another hand, but... Exactly. Because yeah. I was going to say, uh, Frederic, it, when you talk about nothingness, a lot of it is personal experience. Whereas what these philosophers are also trying to get to is kind of an objective sense of what it is. Do you believe in a personal nothingness? Or is it the same nothingness for everybody? I think, no, I think that there is a difference. I think a personal nothingness, an experience of nothingness can be varied and very different. Um, I think sometimes when people are plagued, especially by psychological um, issues, for instance, uh, like I've, I've had some knowledge, uh, both personally and, and with friends, of burnouts and, and things like that, then you can feel like you're not doing what you should be doing, like you're worth nothing or you're you're not going to anything, so what are you doing? Nothing. And, and that could be a very negative feeling of nothing. And I think what the Kyoto philosophers provide is a different way of thinking about nothing. So even if you feel in the Western sense like you're not doing what you should be doing and you're nothing or you're not doing the, the things, then this may make room for a more positive view. And I'm not sure as a philosopher or as a person in, in any reason or even if it's about nothing or something that we ever understand each other. Even if you say, oh, I understand what you're talking about. I don't know if you really understand and I don't think we can ever get to that. But that's my own personal view. So I won't project that onto you, but I'll do my best to try and understand. But I don't think you can ever really be sure about that. I would have to agree. But in the meantime, we do have the books. So if people want to find out more about the nothingness and the approaches that these guys are talking about, then these are, uh, I mean, 
come forward after the lecture, take a look at the books. I guess I could post them online as well after the lecture. Yeah. By the way, this has been recorded, so uh, we're going to put this online in hopefully two or three weeks, together with part one, which uh, the recording has been finished and will be put online today. So I want to thank everybody for coming today. I want to thank Frederic. And again, she's staying here for a few more minutes, so uh, please stick around if you have more personal questions or objective questions for Frederic. <coughs> and a last round of applause, and hope to see you again next time. Arigato.